Welcome back to Conversations Different, the podcast from the Santa Fe, New Mexican that focuses on interesting people and issues of northern New Mexico. This week, we are going to take you inside one of Santa Fe's best museums and a unique museum across the United States. With us are Tatiana Lomahevtawa Singer and Brian Fleetwood, who will tell us about the Museum of Contemporary Native Arts. Welcome, Tatiana. Welcome, Brian. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's start out uh, by telling people about this museum and what makes it unique. It is literally the best of its kind in the United States. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I want to first say that we are part of the Institute of American Indian Arts, uh, which is located 20 minutes south of downtown Santa Fe. Uh, and that and then in downtown Santa Fe proper, is where the II Museum of Contemporary Native Arts is situated. And both locations, I'd like to just uh, mention, are located on the traditional Pueblonian lands of the Tanoan and Kara-speaking peoples. And we honor and thank them for their graciousness and stewards of this land. And IIA is a a fine arts college or a college for Native people to, or Indigenous people to study fine arts. And the museum uh, represents not only indigenous contemporary art of II, but also uh, broadly contemporary art around the world. Right. And at IAI, you can also study indigenous native studies. There's a new film component, sculpture. Yes. I mean, it's an incredible college. Yeah, I, we could go on. We could have a whole <laughs> segment just in IIA, but true. Yeah, yeah. We, we have studio arts, museum studies, cinematic arts, performing arts, uh, indigenous liberal studies, creative writing. We have undergraduate degree programs, associate degree programs, certificate programs, MFA program in studio arts, yeah. cultural administration, creative writing, and... That's it for now. The, yeah. There are some in development, but... Right. Um, and Brian, you're a associate professor, assistant, yeah. assistant professor yeah. of uh, studio arts. Yes, and uh, my specialization is jewelry. Yeah, right. Oh, that's that's something, yeah. and that's obviously an old traditional art. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. I, I personally think that jewelry is maybe the most fundamental human art form, and some of the oldest examples of art making we have are jewelry objects, um, way way older than like the cave paintings that often get. Uh, claimed as the first uh, examples of human art making. Wow, I did not know that. I I know that in addition to, you know, let's say old Navajo silversmithing and those kinds of things, there's this huge uh, contemporary movement in jewelry today that is pretty awesome, and especially in the Native world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, especially in the Southwest, there are huge jewelry traditions, Navajo, Pueblo, Hopi, and Apache uh, jewelers, but um, there are jewelry traditions across North and South America that have lineages that reach back thousands and thousands of years. Yeah, well, that that makes it fun, and you can go to museums and and see these things. Mm -hmm. Now, the relationship uh, between IAI and the Museum of Contemporary Native Arts is very, you know, they're one entity in some ways with two parts. Is that right? So the acronym for our museum is MOCNA, right? Museum of Contemporary Native Arts. And we, we, we are a college art museum, uh, university art museum, but we're also unique for showcasing real progressive ideas, uh, art that's happening in the field, both activism, uh, you know, uh, monograph shows, um, traveling exhibitions. Uh, we also do a lot of international exhibitions of contemporary indigenous arts, um, both thematic and then also, again, monographs. So, yeah, that's that's how that's how we're doing. But then we do showcase the collection, like this uh, jewelry exhibition that we'll be talking about. And we do showcase uh, current student graduate work in the springtime right. annually. Yeah, we, we tend, as a family, we like to go to that and buy people before they're famous. <laughs> that, that's been one of our, our collective activities. That's one of the benefits of teaching at the school is you get in on the ground floor before uh, you get priced out. Yes, <laughs> yes, and, and that can happen very quickly because this is uh, – people, at least in this world, in Santa Fe, are compensated not maybe at the level they deserve, but closer than a lot of places, I think. 
get a good start here for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, my son was going to be a painter for a long time, and I always told him, at least you're in a place where when you say that, they don't say, are you crazy? Why would you do that? <laughs> so the museum is interesting because you've had some donations in recent years, which makes it like free on some days, more affordable. Talk oh. about how you're supported uh, by billionaires in a way that you know not many museums have you know that kind of uh, support. Yeah, it's it's really came about since the pandemic, the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, all of that, that foundations wanted to help support people of color and institutions that were small and struggling or, you know, had more challenges than, than other institutions. And so we received a few private foundation grants to help us grow and expand programming and help other artists and and expose uh, our our visitorship our audiences with you know other indigenous thoughts and um, ideas and art that's happening around the world so that that has helped us to broaden also expand staff because uh, resources have been really difficult and we're still pretty small right but um, but we're able to do more challenging and, and bigger um, projects because of those those private um, grants that we've received and the, um, the support we receive from foundations through annual grant renewals and that kind of thing. Okay. And one of the things I always tell people is that so many of Santa Fe's museums are closed on Monday, but Mokna is open. Correct. So we're open daily except for Tuesdays. Okay. So we're 10 to 5. I, th- I think the weekend's a little bit different, but but we're open daily at 10 right. besides Tuesdays. Right. And that's because the museums in Santa Fe are all closed Mondays. Typically, they, they have uh, seasonal hours. So right. In the summer, some of them are open on Mondays, but not, but, not that's all. That's right. Yeah. Seven days a week. But annually, you know, we, we are open um, every day except for Tuesdays. And that's so that people... When they're in the downtown area and they want to go see something, and if there's a museum closed, they can come to us. Right. That's and, that's and, what I've always thought. Yeah. yeah it's a great so, – and you're right across the street from the St. Francis Basilica Cathedral, so right. it's very easy to find. And uh, it's interesting how we repurpose buildings in Santa Fe. The museum used to be the post office. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's actually still a federal building. Okay. Uh, it's on loan to us in perpetuity or as long as we want or need it. And – it did used to house all those federal agencies like the Bureau of Land Management and the CIA and whatever, post office being the main office or department. But then over time, those departments all grew and they built their own buildings within Santa Fe and moved away from the downtown area. It was vac, you know, the, the building was not being used. And we had some folks help to lobby to, you know, get the get the building for our use and they renovated it. So the outside facade, because it's under, it's on the National Historic Register. Looks the same. We couldn't really touch at all, which is okay because we're, you know, we're happy to be downtown and part of the culture. But the inside is completely renovated for showcasing contemporary Native art. Nice. And on that, we'll take a break and we'll be back in a moment with conversations different to discuss what you can see right now at Mokna. Thanks, Inez. This is Patrick Dorsey, publisher of the Santa Fe New Mexican. We hope you're enjoying this episode of Conversations Different with Inez Russell Gomez. Great local content is only possible with a talented staff dedicated to bringing you the best local content possible. For that staff to do its work, we need your support by subscribing to the Santa Fe New Mexican. If you're already a subscriber, thank you. And if not, there's never been a better time to subscribe. In addition to our home-delivered newspaper that comes with full digital access, we also provide digital-only subscriptions for SantaFeNewMexican.com. We'll also be releasing more online-only audio and video programming moving forward. The Santa Fe New Mexican has been here for nearly 175 years, and we want to continue being your source for local news and information. Visit us at SantaFeNewMexican.com slash subscribe or call us at 505-986-3010. Thank you. 
It's a new day in New Mexico, and the doors to boundless opportunity are open as tens of thousands of New Mexicans reach higher to pursue a dream, broaden their horizons, and retrain for a better job. With the New Mexico Lottery and Opportunity Scholarships, you could build yourself a better future anywhere in the state. You put in the hard work, we'll help with the costs. For eligibility details, visit ReachHireNM.com. Welcome back to Conversations Different. We're talking to Tatiana Loma Hefta with Singer and Brian Fleetwood about the exhibitions inside the Museum of Contemporary Native Art, which is part of the Institute of American Indian Arts. Brian, you are the curator. Uh, tell us about the stories we carry. Well, the stories we carry is kind of a survey of the recent history of contemporary native jewelry from the earliest 20th century to about now, um, especially as it relates to the Institute of American Indian Arts. Um, most of the exhibition comes from the collections. We were able to make a couple of purchases from um, from our artists and residents uh, to include in the show, and we've got some loans from former faculty and current and um, recent students, but most of everything else is from the collection, and there's over a hundred works in the the exhibition. I'm not sure exactly what that count is. Mm -hmm. So tell us what jewelry tells us about people. Uh, That's a good question. A lot of things. Um, You know, people wear jewelry to tell people who they are, um, Mm -hmm. to remind themselves where they've come from. Jewelry is often a symbol of office or rank or achievement. Think, uh, you know, Super Bowl rings and Olympic medals and military medals, police badges. Um, They're symbols of culture. Uh, My my definition of jewelry is very broad. Basically, if it's artwork and it goes on the body, it's jewelry. So um, as far as I'm concerned, tattoos are jewelry, and there's a huge indigenous tattoo revitalization movement. You know, tattoos were something where you could tell who somebody was from a long way away, and you could tell whether they were an ally or a friend or someone who was from your culture. So, you know, it's ultimately about who we are, who we would like to be seen as, and where we come from. Wow. And it's part of, uh, so 100 objects, That's is that in a big room, or how is it displayed? There are three rooms that are divided into sort of three different categories. The first room we're calling the, um, the process room. There, each of the cases features a different form or process, like tufa casting or mm-hmm. lapidary, mm-hmm. things like that. The second room we are calling our community room, and it includes works from current and recent students, uh, former faculty, and recent artisan residents. Some of the people featured are Charles Lolima, Kenneth Johnson, Jody Webster, Anthony Lovato. Uh, who was just named uh, a Living Treasure. Right, for the Native Treasure yeah. show. And um, so that room is focuses on IAI's community. The student case uh, includes like in-progress works, examples of tools and uh, like molds and things like that. And then the final room we're calling the storytelling room, which involves sort of work that comes out of particular like narrative or culture. So we have works that are based in like Western culture, bolo ties, belt buckles, bogards. We have work that is emblematic of traditional Southwest work, traditional Northwest coast work. Um, and then we have work that is sort of more conceptual in that, artists who are focusing on political issues or, uh, you know, sort of personal uh, or, or community-based issues. Oh, nice. One of the things that I think is so fascinating is how cultures in the Southwest blended because the, the Spanish brought the silver, the design of that necklace that everyone wears. Yeah, the squash blossom. The squash yeah. blossom. And then the Navajo adapted it in such a way that made it theirs. Yeah, absolutely. The the crescent shape that is, you know, the central or- ornament, the naja of the uh, squash blossom, that is the Islamic crescent by way of the Moors through the Spanish that were then introduced to the native people in the area. So, you know, that's... Again, a really interesting story that is sort of emblematic of 
how jewelry works, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when you think about uh, like going, getting jewelry from Santo Domingo, so they use shells. Yeah. And it's like, we're in the middle of the desert. Where do they get shells? And that lets you into a bigger story about the interconnectedness of the indigenous world. Absolutely. Um, the, the, trade uh, routes you can find in um, pre-contact jewelry examples. You know, there are examples of Venetian glass beads that were traded into the Americas before contact that are found in South America. So, you know, the trade routes from the tip of South America to Siberia were established long before Europeans even knew the continent existed. Uh-huh. I believe. So there's so many stories. It's an adornment for the body, but it's the stories we carry. What a great, that, that that's just a great name. I love that. Um, what is your role in all of this? Because you're, you know, a big shot at the museum. So that's a, that's a very professional title. Uh, I, I don't think I'm a big shot. Yeah, you are. You are. But, well, curator of collections. Curator of collections. Yes. So our, our collection is getting close to 9,500, or we might have surpassed that by now. But our last count, not too long ago, was, it was around 9,500. Wow. And um, mostly contemporary Native art. And the collection does a really good job of documenting the II art history, um, because way before me, people were collecting works out of, that were coming out of the program, out, out of the studios, um, both from students, faculty, and staff. So we can see this really rich history of II through the art collection, but also the archives. And we're moving towards this uh, research center idea now, a research center of contemporary native art, where we're bringing the archives and art collection together, but also including our community um, that are coming to the to the campus, the artists and residents and Scholarly Fellows, the MFA folks, and goes on and on. But anyway, um, this collection is housed at the campus because we, we could no longer um, – we, we had outgrown the spaces I was going to say had. you don't have room. That's right. Yeah. So we moved from the museum downtown, the location, out to the campus and built a whole new storage just to house it and, and be able to utilize it. And uh, because of this – this new development that happened, uh, which is actually, we're now like 11 years now. But um, we've, been, we've been able to do focus exhibition, large um, shows out of the collection um, year round now because the second floor where it was housed got converted into permanent exhibit space for the collection. So um, that's how this show came about. This is the first time we've done a, a full focus uh, on the jewelry of the collection out of the collection. And I actually, I think it's around 250 pieces of jewelry, over 100 artists are represented in, I think is what it comes out to. Yeah, I don't remember the exact count, except my original selections were about twice what we had. That's right, with. yeah. <laughs> I, had, I had to edit Brian down because those cases were packed. You right. couldn't even see anything. And there's still a lot to see. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he that's... did a really good job of breaking down the ideas and helping people basically journey through these rooms and they, they all connect together. Right. And that's really why you go to a museum is, is to learn how the influences come together and, and mm-hmm. affect what we're doing today. Mm-hmm. Right. And on that note, we will take a short break and be back with Conversations Different. My name is Maria Jose Rodriguez Cadiz, and I am the Executive Director with Solace Sexual Assault Services. Our mission is to prevent sexual violence and empower survivors of sexual violence through restoring dignity, strength, and resiliency. For almost 51 years, Solace has reduced the impact of sexual violence. We do it by focusing on human rights, social justice, hope, and dignity. We believe survivors are experts in their own experiences and acknowledge that empowering them is crucial to their healing. Our advocacy, forensic interviewing, and therapy services are centered to their needs. Our sexual violence prevention programs in schools and community is just as important. 
please check our website at findsolace.org. And if in need, you can call our 24-7 hotline, which is 800-721-7273. Your support is crucial to the lives of survivors. Thank you. Gracias. Welcome back to Conversations Different, where we are talking about what you can see at the Museum of Contemporary Native Arts in downtown Santa Fe. You've got the Stories We Carry, which is a large exhibit, mm -hmm. but with that, there's smaller exhibitions that are coming along, and, and our stories is up right now. And what will people see if they, they visit that? So on the second floor were the permanent collect permanent. The gallery for the permanent collection is located. There's a hallway right outside that gallery, and Brian and I and the ed education curatorial staff, we were trying to figure out what we were going to do with that hallway because we wanted to do um, like an educational <laughs> <laughs> exhibit, and we we had this really brilliant idea that we couldn't pull off, and that was to do light jewelry because there's these windows, these windows that face east, and so there's a lot of light Ooh. coming in, and we thought we would do like um, – cutouts or scrims on the windows that people could stand for the wall and there would be jewelry or these patterns coming through and there'd be light jewelry like a squash blossom made out of light or whatever, of princess crown and stuff. But we just couldn't pull it off. So we scratched that idea and then we decided to do a community show and invite community members to curate from their own personal jewelry collections items that have meaning to them. Oh, or, I love that. So to, to relate to our visitors, um, because jewelry is relatable across the board to, yeah. you know, human, everybody. And so the first iteration was last, let's see, when was that last? Um, well, it opened, September, right? Yeah, it opened, oh, August, August. It opened Indie Market Weekend. Yeah, yeah. that's yep. right. Yeah, last August. And so... Um, we invited five people, and Brian was one of them. Uh, and then our educator, Wayne Gassion, our museum director, Patsy Phillips, our academic, who's now our academic gene, Dr. Jesse Riker Crawford, and Marcus Amberman. Nice. Um, and they had no problem curating. They did a really – Did like, Marcus do his bracelets? There were a couple there, of yeah, yeah, yeah. But other people threw in Marcus Yeah, I think there were their, three cases yeah. out of the five that had Marcus's yeah. work. <laughs> and the stories were just amazing. Yeah, I really encouraged them to bring work that was maybe not, you know, quote unquote fine jewelry. And mm -hmm. we got some really interesting stuff. Jesse Riker Crawford uh, had a uh, enameled uh, Grateful Dead belt buckle from when she was a deadhead and followed them on tour. Oh, I love that. Um, oh. She also had a, a, sh a Sherry's Diner pin that she wore when she was a waitress putting herself through school. Um, and those are the kind of stories, right? We, we adopt the things that we put on our bodies that both are a record of who we are and where we've been, but also the things that we want to communicate our, about ourselves to other people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know. It was a really exciting way because we got – to have the people who had the jewelry in their collection tell us the stories about where the jewelry came from, why it's important to them, um, why they wear it, and other things. Yeah, because it, it, you know, some of the stories are about values, some of them are about identity, um, and and then some of them are just like precious memories about relationships. A grandma, yeah. Relationships. Yes. Thank you. Yes, and. Um, that came down a couple of weeks ago, and we just installed the second iteration. Now we're what we're calling it is uh, winter and summer okay. uh, rotations. So this was the winter rotation that just opened on February second, and it's the entire Gassion family. Uh, oh, so the the matriarch Connie Gassion, and then her three sons and daughter, and yeah. we. Um, oh, that's we, why Tazba's picture was in. Uh, anyway, Connie's husband is. My great aunt's my cousin. It's it's in New Mexico. We we figured this out. But my 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 uncle, my great uncle Alejandro, married uh, Camila Gasson, and oh, that's Jerry's. Okay. They're related, right. and that that's our big. Uh, we decided we were going to call each other Prima after. Yeah, I just uh, yeah. I learned so much from from 
from those guys. I mean, just not only about them, but their relationships with the, within New Mexico, mm-hmm. with the Institute, just their rich tradition. She was tradition. in Up With People. Like, that's right. Yeah. 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 The rich tradition of jewelry that's, that, that yeah. goes generations back. Mm-hmm. So it was um, – it was, it's just been so much fun doing this show, I think. And um, and again, we're not really curating. We're just capturing their stories. Right, right. And we're bringing, and then Brian does all the layout and he helps with the editing because it's really hard to edit these stories down to like 75 words. Oh, wow. So um, it's, just, it's just, you guys have to come see it. I'm I got to see that. Yeah. I think I have a piece by every one of them. Mm-hmm. Although my my belt from uh, Connie that was also a necklace was stolen in a burglary, so someone else has my oh. Connie Kassan piece. But yeah, that that and was. Uh, I wanted to say too, um, our education department does a really good do- job with virtual tours. Right. So I'm hoping I, this is going to take some work, but I'm going to have to um, edit. Some of these stories, so I'd like to have the audio of these stories because I had to edit edit out like the really cool stuff to get it down so it's readable. Um, and they're still cool stories. Yes. But, oh, my God, some of these stories were just amazing. Like the, just the whole narrative with David Gassion and his losing his cl- high school class ring. Oh, yeah. oh. And this guy found it and, and – um, well, actually, this man found it. He passed, and his daughter was going through his things and came across it, and his name was written on it. And so she just Googled him up, found him online, say, hey, I think I have your class ring, mailed it to him, and he got it 25 years later. Oh, I love that. So oh. things like that, yeah. It's yeah. just, But it, the, the narrative is just, and him telling the story is really funny. I mean, we had so much fun <laughs> I laughing. Think, I think that Wayne's story with the dog tooth necklace oh, is yeah. also a really good story. Yeah. He was in, is it New Zealand or was it Hawaii? Um, Hawaii. Hawaii. Yeah. And he was stung by a stingray. Mm-hmm. And so one of the, the people who was hosting him there gave him a dog tooth necklace with his, uh, uh, you know, a traditional way of like, like giving somebody strength or. Oh. Uh, yeah. So it helped him fight the, yeah. the sting off. That That's a great story. And that, that his pressure ring. Uh, yeah. I- so uh, <laughs> Wayne also has a ring, you know. Wayne and David are really innovative in, you know, doing really contemplative, uh, yep. contemporary, conceptual jewelry stuff. And he has a, a thumbscrew ring talking about the pressures of being an artist. So you put the ring on and it's got a handle and you twist it and it's like a, you know. Like a faucet, you know, the faucet. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I love Water that. faucet. Yeah. Yeah. And that's his own work that he made. But it's about, you know, the pressures of being an artist. And, right. You know. Yeah, I like seeing he tweets. Indian mm-hmm. Silver uh, is on Twitter or yeah. X, yeah. and I like looking at the things he presents and, and how he talks about his work. He's, it, yeah, he, he has some really good stories. Yeah. You have to really get it out of him, but he, <laughs> yes. he's quiet. But well, he's, yeah. And he it's so amazing. funny when we first asked him, he's like, oh, well, I don't have any stories yeah. or jewelry with stories. But then <laughs> he came in, and we've got, like, what, six or eight pieces that are just phenomenal. Oh, I love that. Yeah. That's that's an exciting and it, 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 they're such known members of the community, too, so that's a way for all their friends to learn more about people they know and love. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And you yeah. mentioned you had jewelry by each one of them. It, each one of them has jewelry from each other. <laughs> yes. And that was, yep. that was really neat to see. And, and lo- most of them all have something from Connie, either that she made for them when they were little. Right. She would dress them in really good jewelry. Right. Or she just got for them to have, you know, that they could wear either daily or for dancing and things like that so um and then just her case alone just the matriarch and Ooh. the roots and and her influence on all all her children is yeah. it's just really beautiful there's yeah. examples of connie's student work from when she was a student at iaia um there's a, a tufa cast um piece of sheet that she got from charles lolima the stories are the connections between the Gassan family and the rest of the native art world and the jewelry world in particular are phenomenal. And you can see a lot of that in those cases. That's, that's definitely worth going to see. Yeah. And uh, on that note, we will encourage everyone to visit the Museum of Contemporary Arts from the Institute of American Indian Arts. If you want to know more about them, uh, go to iaia.edu mokna, and you can find it online. And we will post other information about the exhibition hours on our show website. And with that, we will be back again next week. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, Tatiana. Absolutely. We appreciate your time.
Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. This has been another Conversations Different.